Welcome to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered with Perry Clark. This program looks at mental health from unique perspectives and shows you how to manage your life by finding the knots that help you and stay away from the ones that could be a disadvantage. Now, here is your host, Perry Clark. Hello all, welcome back to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. I'm Perry Clark, licensed merged family therapist here with you. I want to remind you, as always, that this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only. Please seek out a mental health professional in your area to work on your unique issues. So, as we are continuing to celebrate uh, LGBT Pride Month, I have a new guest for you to meet here who uh, I was on a panel with earlier this spring uh, talking about queer horror and continuing that aspect of sharing the quality that we have, not only as LGBT, but also as people, BIPOC people, what it looks like for us to be in in this industry of looking at enjoying our lives. And so today, we're going to be talking with Candace McCaffrey, also known as Candace the Magnificent, is a black, queer, gender-fluid voice actor, TTRP performer, streamer, and writer. When they're not working, she enjoys obsessing over pop culture, collecting books, spending time with her two cats, and making beautiful things. You can learn more about them uh, uh, from their link tree, uh, Candace the Magnificent, which will be in the show notes as well. So, Candace. Welcome to Untying Knots. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, thank you for being here, and thank you for taking the opportunity to, after our chat when Queer Horror to be here. As I always do, start off with the question of, how did you get here? So, um, I got here uh, in a super roundabout way. Um, I met you on a panel for a Weekend with Good Friends, which is um, kind of a call of Cthulhu at its heart, but horror-embracing mm-hmm. online convention. Um, and that kind of came from my participation in um, doing professional tabletop role playing games, um, mm-hmm. acting and improving in those. Um, before that, I was actually a copywriter um, at an advertising agency. Um, somebody oh. who sat behind me uh, was interested in TTRPGs, and we had a lot in common. Um, he had this really awesome toy collection on his desk, and I was like, Carl, what's up with you? What kind of guy are you? Uh, and he was like, oh, well, and I, these are all the things I do. I actually am a layout designer for tabletop role-playing games. And I'd like never heard of that before other than Vampire the Masquerade and um, Dungeons and Dragons, obviously. Um, mm. But no one had ever invited me to their table. So I started wow. uh, playing with a handful of people at work mm-hmm. uh, after hours in the conference room. And then that just gradually over time grew into this, which is now I stream and I do about, I don't know, I think... Between four and ten productions a month, depending Fine. on how much time I have. Yeah. Uh, and definitely, we'd love to hear more about that because I'm sure there's many who would love to get into this work, but also understanding what this work takes. Sure, it takes it takes a lot. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort. Um, it's very much one of those um, starving artist gigs. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really interesting because it's storytelling. Uh, that is unique and off the cuff with people who you can kind of choose to, you know, support rather Mm -hmm. than, you know, a a traditional television show where you kind of just have to deal with whoever the actors are and whatever story is being told. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like TTRPGs are a little bit more um, flexible and the amount of imagination that you have to use both to, you know, create that kind of uh, art as well as to consume it, um, I think is just so much more interactive than regular television can be mm-hmm. sometimes especially mm-hmm. in this very reality tv kind of uh driven time that we live in um but yeah it's a real blast uh it is a uh, a community that has fostered a very beautiful queer uh element to it um lots mm-hmm. of uh people in the lgbtqia plus spectrum um it's wonderful for telling queer stories however uh, it is still kind of lacking in um, ethnic diversity. So that's mm-hmm. something that um, we're kind of seeing a rise in, um, and I'm very proud to be part of that change myself. Lovely. So can you share some of the other productions you've been in that are at least out now that people could listen to uh, as opposed to whatever's still in the pipeline? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So this is going to air in June, which yes, means... It is. I will be hosting uh, every Thursday on Chaotic Wholesome Presents, which is um, a a tabletop channel 
uh, on Twitch and YouTube that hosts uh, intersectional content with a diverse a group of people. Kay and David um, run that channel, and it's really fantastic. Uh, I'm going to be doing every Thursday a different Pride stream. Uh, we'll mm. have some guest GMs and some really nice players coming in to play for charity. We're going to be raising money for Black and Pink. Uh, which is an LGBTQIA plus uh, BIPOC focused um, prison prison and um, prison of abolitionist movement and mm -hmm. organization. Um, so trying to get get our people out of the positions that we're in, um, we tend to be um, locked up and arrested and um, obviously persecuted more than people in other sectors of existence. Mm -hmm. um, so this uh, black and pink aims to try and kind of level the playing field for people who have been unfortunately um, affected by that, as well as trying to find more social programs to avoid people going into those positions in the first place. Um, so we're going to be doing that every Thursday on Juneteenth itself. There's also a live stream with Jeremy Cobb from, from Three Black Halflings, which is mm -hmm. um, a really fantastic podcast if you are interested at all in TTRPGs and the intersection of people of color. Highly recommended. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm very excited. J June is going to be a big month um, for me. Sounds but, like it. Yeah, um, but you can also hear me in some podcasts. Uh, there's a Girl by Moonlight Magical Girl podcast called Bloom and Blight that I'm a part of that is trans-led mm -hmm. uh, and queer-led as well as Otherworld Hollywood, which is uh, BIPOC and queer-focused. Uh, That's mm -hmm. a Call of Cthulhu 50s campaign. I'm super ah. <laughs> well, especially showing some of the time frames and especially with something like Call of Cthulhu, which one of the things that is often, I, I know is a sort of a staple is there is the sanitariums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you also look at what the history of the sanitarium, which, you know, if you think about it, really was the predecessor to what we're dealing with, with the prison system. Absolutely. You're talking about with black and pink. So if you couldn't, right now they're using the prison system, but at that point they use the sanitarium systems mm -hmm. yep. as another way to, hide people, let alone having a sanitary system that was also for people of color that was, let's just call it functional, if at all best. Yes, absolutely that. And I think that um, one of the really cool things about um, about role playing games that I really love is that you have the, you have the, you have the option to create the stories that you want to tell and that you want to hear rather mm -hmm. than kind of having to dig into, you know, um, in, in things that are just either for shock value or for, you know, um, sensationalizing uh, things that were very horrific on their own and really don't mm -hmm. need to be <laughs> sensationalized. They were already awful. Um, mm -hmm. So like in our Call of Cthulhu campaign, uh, one of the tactics uh, in the game, the mechanics of the game, uh, one of the mechanics is sanity. You have uh, sanity rolls. To mm -hmm. see, you know, your your descent into the breakdown of your mental health as you deal with all of these supernatural entities. Um, in our group, we're kind of sensitive to that, so we mm -hmm. call it resolve instead. So we have resolve checks, and then as your resolve breaks down, the less capable you are of completing your task because you you just can't go on. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of sensitivity that even when it's not present inherently in in gaming, you can kind of bring it to mm -hmm. the situation whereas you know if it's a video game or a board game or something you're kind of just stuck with what the creator decided and you can't really deviate mm -hmm. around that as much that or the uh what the focus group felt that they were feeling much more comfortable with what with the storyline which is how many times have we heard stories of various tv shows or movies getting reshot portions mm -hmm. of it because they needed that didn't fit well with the audience and liked it absolutely and I, and I think that that's honestly for the best because there are some stories that need to be told but might not be the most palatable. And mm -hmm. I think when you when you can get in front of a room full of people, especially people who are actors and who are open to sharing, you know, the experiences that they've had within their characters, you have mm -hmm. some really beautiful and meaningful moments. Like, I think that's honestly one of the coolest parts about being in TTRPGs and being an actor in general, but especially if you're improvising and you're coming up with the story and the character hooks yourself is that when mm -hmm. someone feels seen or heard or represented by something that you've made, it feels so, so much deeper than just being an actor. Like I've, I've also acted, I used to do um, theater and things like that in uh, both grade school and college. Um, mm -hmm. I actually just wrapped a, um, an online 
uh, production of Romeo and Juliet on Twitch. That was this big oh, event. Nice. Uh, yeah, we had like 11,000 people watching us. It was amazing. Um, and like when you when you use someone else's words, you can impart your own take if you want, mm -hmm. but you can't really change the meaning, right? And the intention of the original author or the director that is giving you, you know, your your stage directions and things like that. Um, but when you're doing improv, you you pull from whatever you have. Like you mm -hmm. pull from whatever stories you've got, whatever history you have with your family, whatever knowledge that you've been able to collect over the over the years. Um, as someone who is very neurodivergent and has a lot of special interests and falls down Wikipedia rabbit holes constantly and just kind of soaks up information that I'm like, I'm never going to use that. Guess what? Now I use it in my mm -hmm. tabletop performances. <laughs> Which, as you speak to that, it adds another uh, level to all of this, too, the neurodivergency. Because mm -hmm. that makes both of us in our own ways uh, <laughs> finding our, our finding a place in this medium as well. Because uh, uh, I've been doing a few episodes for uh, Symphony myself mm -hmm. uh, there. Not that I consider myself as practice as you. No, no. But get my hand in there. That's awesome. I love to see that kind of play. I, I wish that tabletop role-playing games were something everybody would try just once. Even if you don't mm -hmm. like it, you don't have to keep it up. But it's something that I would recommend everyone put on their bucket list. Um, it can be so freeing and just like really, I mean, I can't tell you the problems that I've been able to kind of work through while I've mm -hmm. had time to organically be someone else for a while. Like it's really hard to be someone else like in public and go around like that day to day. That's that's very right. heavy. It's difficult. Like a lot of people have to do that that are you know, autistic that have to mask. Right. Like mm -hmm. it can be really stressful to have to do that. Not on your own terms. Um, mm hmm. But with tabletop, you're doing it on your own terms. You've made this character from the ground up. You decide what they like and what they don't like, who their family is, what their interests are, where they're going, what they're doing here. Um, I often like to try to think about what my character might do in the future, too, like for a character arc. Because mm -hmm. experiencing that growth in game when you feel stuck in real life is like nothing short of magic. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, which is some of also what we talked about a bit when we were talking about the queer horror over at Good Friends. Yes. So I'm curious, what would what was your biggest takeaway from that? And what would you want people to know so that they go watch the panel once I put the link in the in the notes as well? You know, it's funny, like content wise, there were a lot of really amazing takeaways. Um, I loved the breadth of examples that we all gave. Right. Like all of us are bringing on paper a similar experience. Right. We are queer mm -hmm. people in a very heteronormative world. And we have different experiences that all kind of ladder up to being able to answer these questions at a panel. But once we're mm -hmm. in it, we have just as many concentric circles as we do differences in opinions and examples. So it was just really wonderful to see those other aspects and elements. But I think that the thing that I really took from it was just like the conduct of the individuals that were participating. Like it was such a lively discussion. And everybody like got to talk and everybody like had really wonderful input to give and gave each other the floor and commented on what someone else said to build off of it and to like get to the next concept. Mm -hmm. um, I've been on um, panels where like, you know, people feel like they really need to prove that they belong there or that they're an expert mm -hmm. or something like that. So they end up, you know, it ends up being kind of like there's an there's an imbalance almost. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that this table, this panel of, of individuals, which is including yourself, obviously, were just so in sync, despite us having like pretty much just met. I think I knew like maybe one or two people there mm -hmm. and, and that was it. Um, and I felt like it went so well, like it was a it was a genuinely pleasant conversation to have. Um, and I think that that kind of collaboration and even the level of understanding when we started kind of talking about the um, the handshaking, maybe not the, the the equality of the problem, but the handshaking mm -hmm. of understanding, like, as black people, the trauma that is like inherent in a lot of our stories because we're minorities and then seeing that represented in the in the queer community. Right. Mm -hmm. how a lot of those stories are also really sad and tragic and all that stuff. Right. Like the of uh, the non black participants of this conversation surprised me with how much they knew and were able to also just sit and listen when one of us said something that was kind of out of their depth or they didn't understand or know. Um, mm -hmm. 
And like, that's not necessarily a common experience in the world. So no. like being, being respectful to others uh, who have experiences outside of that, you understand um, that, which you understand. I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, that's, those are my two favorite parts. Which is good to hear. And hopefully those are listening, will take that into account and go and follow up with that as well uh, as we're going to this next month. So given that you started out in the copying industry and moved into all of this, what were, what do you think was some of the takeaways between jumping between these industries that either are similar or different or that is useful? Because I think one of the biggest things that we often hear is the idea that, and one of the biggest issues that hits our economy right now is the idea that someone's got to stay with something as a single, a singular thing from now till the end of time mm-hmm. or the end of their time. Yeah. So in the advertising world, um, it is very competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and not only is it very competitive, it's very white. Um, mm-hmm. And it's very male. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, it is it is an industry that is very stressful. Um, if you take sick time and you're in advertising, somebody looks at you like, really, you couldn't tough it out. Um, there's actually a new Instacart commercial where these two people are sick and they're still saying that they're online. Like they're still working because mm-hmm. they're trying to one up each other. Like mm-hmm. I, I watch that and I get just hives. Um, <laughs> I, I would love to work at like a smaller ad agency uh, that doesn't have that kind of pacing to mm-hmm. it. Like I, I can do it and I did do it for 10 years, uh, mm-hmm. but it was a lot. Um, I, I loved writing. I loved being able to tell stories. I loved being able to come up with campaign ideas and product ideas. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very much an ideas person. Um, however, I think the thing that I loved the most was presenting my work. Mm. Like I loved being able to go to a client, right? Walk in the room and give them an idea that they need and that I believe in and that I know will make their lives easier and it'll make their company better. It's just hard when you can't pick your clients because, you know, your great idea might be selling linoleum or your great idea might be selling the newest energy drink, right? One is going to have far more creative freedom than the other, which Mm -hmm. granted can be fun creatively because you have to think inside of a smaller box for the linoleum than you do for the energy drink, right? Right. I can say energy drink, put John Cena in it, done, right? Like it can Mm -hmm. be that simple if you have the money. Um, Right. But I also think that uh, there is a certain amount of a challenge in selling your idea and in convincing someone of something. And that's kind Mm -hmm. of what acting is, right? Is like selling somebody your emotions so that they're convinced you're this other character. And Mm -hmm. then TTRPGs goes a step deeper than that, where it's sell me this character without really probably a costume, without Mm -hmm. a musical score, without fancy pyrotechnics without a nice camera necessarily right not on a set you're just in your living room um or you're on a studio set if you're critical role or dimension 20 you know um right so it can be really difficult i think when you don't have that clout behind you that power behind Mm -hmm. you um but that's kind of how i made the the move i actually started streaming while i was still employed and then i got laid off as like a late in the a late in the the pandemic kind of right we we're losing people because Elon Musk has acquired Twitter and no one wants to spend money on ads. Right. I, I was one of those uh, people right. that were, were laid off. Um, and since then the games industry has exploded, right? They've, they've, they're crumbling. They're laying people off by the mm-hmm. dozens every day, if not by the hundreds. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of those people are coming into my industry. So that's even more people that are looking for fewer jobs. Um, people are using chat GPT for their copy, right. you know? So, I was like, you know what? Like, I I can do freelance writing. It's not going to be as consistent as what I had before, but I can do freelance. And um, I already get paid. Not a lot of money, Mm -hmm. but I do get paid uh, to uh, do TTRPG events Mm -hmm. shows and things like that when I'm not doing them for charity. Um, And I do get paid doing VO. So I was like, you know what? Let's let's try it. And I'll I'll be I'll be real. It is lean living being a working artist, (laughs) but. Um, I make things that like matter every day, or at least I feel like they matter. Um, and that's not something that I could say for my fancy advertising job. I knew that I made things that meant something to me, 
mm-hmm. and I could and I could advocate for things that would be better for other people, but I wasn't in charge, so I was really kind of powerless to stop it. If something bad is going to go out, it's going to go out whether I want it to or not. If my if my superiors don't listen, right? Right. But with me, I have ultimate control over pretty much everything that my name is on and my face is on now, mm-hmm. um, which is wonderful. So it's a weird jump. I might go back to it if I can choose my client. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my, my, my nesting partner is, uh, is a designer. Um, so we've done some freelance work and things like that together too. And there are a couple of projects we're trying to get off the ground just to kind of explore other ways of um, being able to make money and, and make art. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that I wish more people would try. Just play is so underrated. I think people think that play means that you're ultimately irresponsible and shirking some kind of duties. Like the entire time that I was laid off until very recently, (laughs) I would spend hours and hours of my time just like forcing myself to try and do something with myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I felt if I'm going to if I sit down and play video games, I'm like, you're getting nothing done. You're doing Mm -hmm. absolutely nothing right now. Right. Like I'd feel so guilty because I was really kind of uh, struggling with job as personality sort mm-hmm. of thing mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and i think that's like a fight that i'm still sort of battling <laughs> um, i think a lot of people are <laughs> fighting with yeah. that especially with everything that has transpired in these last uh, almost five years and the idea yeah. of how much of your identity <laughs> is tied up into what job you do yeah it's it's hard like it's really difficult to shake that and to understand what it looks like to to do work right mm-hmm. like Part of what I do as an artist is I feel my feelings. And mm-hmm. if I'm going to feel my feelings, that means attending to relationships in my life that matter. I'm polyamorous. I have multiple partners. Uh, so I check in with them. Then I have very close friends. Then I have friends that are outside of that ring a little bit. Um, and I'm someone who's very community focused. Like I, if I can make somebody's day better, I'll try, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so some days I wake up and I have a bunch of things to record in the booth. And then some days I wake up and I have some writing to do. And then some days I wake up and someone in those three circles of my life are having a terrible day, Mm -hmm. sometimes more than one person. (laughs) And if I have the spoons, right. If I have the wherewithal, I offer that to them and try to help them through that day. Um, because sometimes like you just feel stuck and all you need is someone to go, no, no, you're good. Like you just need a quick check in. Um, and so I try to offer that because when I need it, I knew that someone will like talk me down off of my ledge. Um, and like not even as just like a reciprocal thing, but just kind of a cultivating that like it's OK to like have a freak out. Like it's fine mm-hmm. to just be like, what are we doing anymore? Right. Like it's fine to like. Mm-hmm doom scroll for three hours and then be like can someone please get me out of this pit that i'm in like i'm in this pit i'm never coming out of it someone please right like i think it's really powerful to be able to make those connections so i try to stay mindful of the connections that i have and foster them um so when i play video games or when i'm rolling dice or when i'm doing something that's play like i'm Mm -hmm. i'm recharging right i'm still Mm -hmm. i'm still working (laughs) even though i'm not at work um, and that's been something that, uh, the, re- the reality of that has been very freeing for me. I'm trying nice. to start streaming soon because of it. Uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> oh yeah. Especially with the, sort of that aspect of, oh, we've got to be nice and ready for the camera every time. It's like, yeah, there's plenty of times where it's like, that's camera being on a camera is the last thing I'm in the mood for right now. It is a huge roadblock for me to the point where mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? Maybe I should look at a VTuber. Mm-hmm. VTubers are big now. Just putting a little cartoon thing, a little cartoon rig of yourself on the screen so that nobody mm-hmm. has to look at you. Um, I've actually done a couple of uh, video game streams with no camera, um, mm-hmm. but I find it challenging to to like connect with people when I don't have my camera on. So I'm now I'm in this place where I'm just like, maybe it doesn't matter if you look like trash <laughs> while you're streaming. Maybe it's just the streaming that matters. Maybe someone else looks like trash. And now they feel a, le- a little less trash because you were brave enough to come out here like this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which I think is an interesting uh, an aspect looking, because we've talked about the idea of that so many of our generations or previous generations are dealing with the idea of work and identity being so connected. Mm-hmm. The thought of this also is being, how is this played out for us as culture? 
Yeah. And the aspect of some would still consider even what we're doing right here, uh, laziness as opposed to grinding the, the millstone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's, um, that's something that is a real shame because it kind of keeps you from discovering that happiness within your work as mm -hmm. well. Right. No matter what it is that you do. Um, it can be incredible to find that sense of like completeness in finishing a project. Mm -hmm. It's, it's super random, but, um, I, my, a friend of mine bought me the pride Lego set. Everyone is awesome. A mm -hmm. few years ago as a, as a pride present. Um, and I had never put together a Lego set. I have brothers that are eight and 10 years younger than me. So that was prime Lego time. And they were children. And my mom was like, they're going to eat all of your Legos. I'm not paying millions of dollars to save my children's lives when I could just not have Legos in the house. So I just wasn't <laughs> allowed to have Legos as a child. Um, so I kind of like missed the boat on that. I could never get my head around why people wanted to build with tiny bricks. I'm like, what, where is the fun? Um, so then I like put together the super gay Lego set, which was wonderful. Um, the colors were amazing. Um, if you are at all AUDHD, Lego sets are where it's at. You can hyper focus. There's lots of colors. The bricks clink really nice. It's awesome. It's just the best thing you could possibly do for yourself. Uh, they are expensive as heck, but worth it, in my opinion, if you have the money. Uh, so I put together that first Lego set and it was life changing. Um, I had a troll come after me. I streamed it mm -hmm. and somebody came and said nasty things to me, but I still had a really good time. Um, and I have more Lego sets now and I love putting them together and then I love taking them apart and like putting them in their designated baggies because I have a little like plastic resealer. Mm -hmm. So I just keep them all in the same bag um, <laughs> that they came in. Um, and then like each time you just like open it up again and you like start anew. It's so good. Um, but I would highly recommend uh, Legos to people who are struggling to, to complete projects mm -hmm. um, or struggling to find meaning like in your day job. If you can mm -hmm. find something outside of that that makes you happy, it makes the day job that much easier to do because you have something waiting for you rather than just, I guess I'm going to come home and watch Survivor tonight, right? Which if that gives you genuine pleasure, that's good too. Not yucking your yum. But like, I feel like Legos are so easy to feel that sense of accomplishment because it doesn't take forever to put them together, right? And when you, the lax brick goes in, you're like, yeah, right? <laughs> right. Well, because there's just, yeah, from what I'm also hearing is, is that it's also that aspect of you know what to expect with that. Yes. You know you start with this brick, you're going to end with that brick. Yes. And having that certainty is something that can also be very comforting for people. Absolutely. It's very especially, soothing. Yeah, especially with the uncertainty that can so much exist in this world. Oh, yeah. In a very big way. Um, I've actually been uh, dealing with anxiety lately and... Um, I have a bunch of Lego sets that I have not put together yet on top of my entertainment center. So um, I have a plan in place mm -hmm. to do some Legoing once a week, uh, either for stream or for personal fun. I think streaming is personal fun, though. Um, and just kind of get through that. Uh, I think like with TTRPGs, you can feel a sense of accomplishment if you do like a one shot, especially mm -hmm. charity one shots. Like I love charity streams. Charity streams are honestly one of the highlights of my TTRPG experience because it's like the the best of both worlds, right? You're entertaining people to get them to spend money for a cause that you believe in, but also you're doing something that you love and it's so much fun, right? It's like, it's wonderful. Um, I love doing charity streams. Um, those I'll always make me feel recharged after because you can kind of see mm -hmm. the good that you've done in the past three to four hour session. Like the financial amount of good that you are putting into the world is right there. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that that is another thing that I think is really wonderful. Um, but yeah, anything that like feels like you have completed a project to me is invaluable. And um, I think that's something that I get even more in this industry than I did in my last one. That satisfaction. And you know, I think <laughs> that's a beautiful place for us to take a break. So stay tuned for our second half here on Untie Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. I'm Perry Clark, I'm licensed marriage and family therapist. Here with Candace the Magnificent. So stay tuned for our second half. Enjoying our shows and can't get enough of us? Follow us on Instagram at Voice America Talk Radio. 
and see what we're cooking up for you. Do you have knots? Not the physical tightness in your neck and back, and not the ones on a rope, but metaphors for the helpful and unhelpful tugs in life that can help us ascend to a new level or stop us from falling too far back down. Join host Perry Clark for Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered, a program about mental health and its practice from an indigenous person of color. We'll help you find the knots that help you and avoid the ones that don't. Listen for new episodes every other week on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Our lives and the world around us can get messy and frustrating. Untangle and Grow Counseling's focus is to untangle that mess and make sense of it so you have a good foundation to build and grow from. Visit us on the web at untangleandgrowcounseling.com. Perry Clark offers individual psychotherapy, couples and family therapy, and adolescence therapy from a variety of coping materials and resources. Visit untangleandgrowcounseling.com for more information. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com. Become a member of VoiceAmerica.com. It's easy and best of all, it's free. Start out by going to our homepage or any of our channels and click register at the top. Once you've created an account and signed in, you can create your own custom library, opt into our newsletter, search by show, host, guest, or topic of interest, or browse millions of hours of content across all of our Voice America radio channels. Membership gets you more. Visit VoiceAmerica.com today to get started and tailor the listening experience to your taste. You are listening to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. If you have a question or comment about our podcast, send an email to pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. That's pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. And now, back to the program. Hello, all. Welcome back to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. I'm Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist, here with Candace the Magnificent, uh, Black queer, gender fluid, a voice actor, TTRP performer, streamer, and writer. So we were just talking a bit about uh, Legos in our previous uh, end section, but uh, you talked about how your industry, with the aspect of being laid off during COVID and such, you had to pivot, well, some would say pivot, but find other areas. And so I'm kind of curious if hearing more about the voice acting standpoint of this, and then Let's talk a bit about some of your pop culture interests. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Voice acting is something that I've always kind of dreamed of doing. It's one of those things that like you see and you hear and you're like, oh, what a cool job. And then like it's just kind of in the back of your mind. Like for some people, that's being an astronaut. For some people, Mm -hmm. it's being like a firefighter, right? You're not thinking about the actual logistics and whether or not you'd be good at it. You're just like, that seems like a cool thing. And then you kind Mm -hmm. of forget about it. Um, And that was it for me. Um, I actually studied to be a librarian when I got out of college, um, but it was right around the uh, economic decline of 2008 when all of those library jobs dried up. And I was like, you're about to go into hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for a degree that you're going to get paid thirty five thousand dollars a year to do each year. Are you sure? Are you sure? And I was like, "Mm, no. So I put that on hold. Uh, it was a real shame because I love books. I'm obsessed with books uh, and I have always been, but it just was, it just didn't, it just didn't work out. I was just like, I, there's no way. Um, so uh, I, I pushed pause on that degree. Um, I dropped out of grad school and I did a bunch of things, a bunch of jobs, retail and like customer service. And um, I was doing um some continuing education classes for like a restoration company. I was teaching, like I was doing all kinds of random stuff. Um, And uh, it led me to uh, starting like a burlesque troupe um, and doing kind of creative pursuits outside of that to um, kind of keep that artistic side of myself going Mm -hmm. since I really couldn't do theater anymore. Um, And then that actually led me to meeting my nesting partner, who is a toy designer and illustrator and product designer and packaging and stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. And he was working in advertising and was like, you should try copywriting. You're a great writer. Um, so then I started kind of getting things from the ground up and then eventually kind of 
wandered over here, as you heard in the mm -hmm. beginning of this. Um, while I was in advertising, because I love present presenting my ideas so much, um, several people told me that I had a nice voice and that I should do a podcast. And I was like, okay, what about? And they never had an answer. They were just like, no, your voice is just like a good like podcast. Mm -hmm. voice. Like I could hear you on NPR. And I was like, I mean, that is a compliment. Uh, yeah. What, what do you do with that, though? Right? <laughs> like, I can't yeah. call up NPR and be like, hi, I have no experience. I just got a nice voice. Do you have any jobs for me? Right? I can't. That's not going to work. Uh, so a friend of mine um, about two years ago, uh, he is he and his daughter uh, launched a, a TTRPG called Nua Varden, and they were uh, going out for their first push on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted a trailer made and somebody that I was collaborating with at the time uh, was like, hey, I know you like off you like made a joke about being a voice actor a few weeks ago. Are you into that? And I was like, well, yeah, but like, how am I going to do that? Like, don't you have to like, go to school for that and stuff? And he was like, I mean, not from what I can tell, like, do the research, see what you think. And I was like, all right. And like, I'm very much a person who likes to look things up and kind of dive mm -hmm. in and obsess over it for a while. You were a librarian studies. I mean, come on. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, the I do not change my stripes. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I I realized that it was something that I that I already kind of understood because I did have proper acting training from my time being, mm -hmm. you know, in in stage plays and things like that, and musicals in school. Mm -hmm. So um, I just kind of went for that first role, and I did uh, way too many takes. And we made mm -hmm. a trailer and people complimented uh, the, them on it. The, it ended, the Kickstarter ended up not working out. They're going to launch again soon. But um, my the, the voiceover that I did was great. And then that got me my first narration gig for mm -hmm. uh, an animated series. It's uh, the opening intro for Aether Fount, which is like a 16 or 18 or 16 or 32 bit uh, kind of pixel uh, mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons hybrid uh, cartoon. It's like an indie cartoon on YouTube. Definitely check that out. Um, and, uh, from there, I just kept using the samples that I had mm -hmm. to get more and more jobs. Um, until one day I got a job, uh, working for, uh, Dell doing a Dell commercial, which was oh. wild because that was me on the other side of the microphone. Like I used to be the one who wrote the commercials and then had to coach the vocal talent in mm. recording their part for my commercial and now i'm the voice actor and a copywriter is talking to me and explaining the process and i'm just like this is so weird um it was really cool but it was very weird um i think the, the one of the I'm, I'm working on a lot of cool things i've done a lot of audio dramas i've done some fan stuff uh there's a star wars fan podcast that's coming out soon that i'm in um that has some cool mandalorian stuff mm -hmm. uh a few that are based on like high fantasy concepts and things like that. Um, one that's an AP, uh, a new AP called Frequencies that's coming out. Um, lots of cool things that I have kind of in the pipeline for myself. But um, I think the, the most interesting voice acting story that I have is um, I applied for something called Passage Through Time or Twilight or something that mm -hmm. looked like it was about uh, Greco-Roman mythology, which I love, love, love Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. um so i was like gotta get on that and i auditioned for a character and i never heard back and i was like "Ugh, i was probably awful they probably didn't want me it's fine i gotta i gotta get better i gotta get good so to speak like the gamers say right um and i just sort of sort of forgot about it mm -hmm. months 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 go by like six months went by completely forgot about this audition i'd done until one day I opened my email and I have an email from a company called Six to Start telling me that I've been cast in an official Marvel mobile app as uh -huh. Dr. Fisher in the Hulk universe. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, yeah, we want you to come back for just like the final rounds. We're pretty sure it's mm -hmm. you, but we want to just make sure we have to send right. our official, you know, tests to Marvel. Um, right. But you know, why don't you read for us? You're up against, you know, a handful of people, like 20 people are, are like down to the wire, but we think it might be you. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I went in, I got the role, um, Marvel approved me, and now I work on that. And it's really cool. Um, nice. Yeah, it's really awesome. Like, it's not, it's not like MCU canon no uh, or anything. It's very much like based on the comics themselves. 
Mm-hmm. But it's basically like a fitness app. So if you like um <laughs> if you like Marvel comics or if you like zombies, they have another one called Zombies Run. Um it's all voice acted and basically it like helps you work out alongside of the your favorite heroes and stuff. It's really cute. It's a very interesting concept. Um very nice. Well, because it was also a good thing. He's like, Oh, I could definitely hear you doing also some books on audio too. Oh, you know, I've, I actually have done that. Um, oh. I, I just did uh, Howl Society's, um, they have a crime anthology that's all these mm-hmm. short stories. Um, and I do two of their short stories there. Um, audiobooks are surprisingly difficult to break into without an agent. Mm. Um, I don't, I'm not represented at this time. Uh, I kind of just do it all on my own. Um, it's something that mm-hmm. I'm still kind of uh, just fueled with passion um and and i admit i've i've had a lot of success like i'm very grateful for the amount of success that i've had and where i've been able to get just on my own um mm-hmm. but i think uh audiobooks there's an audible marketplace that i just recently joined that i'm up for uh certain audiobooks and things like that that are more indie and self-published materials but for like the big guys i think you yeah. really have to have somebody go talk to them for you um but we're working up to it Oh yeah, because I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking is that it seems like the more indie authors who want to have their books go from book to audio seem like would be the best option mm-hmm. for that. And I know one of our one of our members of Symphony has written a book called Under the Black Rainbow, and I was like, hmm, mm. maybe that would be something for if you're listening, Bucho. Um, yeah, that might be an, a, an option for you. This would be a great voice for that. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Um, and obviously, it's the unification of two things that I absolutely love, which is voice acting and books. Can't mm-hmm. get enough of books. Mm. I'm that weirdo that like smells a book the second that they get it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Unfortunately, I've got too many books in my to read stack that is that's either for pleasure or for work. That yep. is just like ah, uh, do I story of my life? Story. Story of my life. Every time I sit down to read, something else pops up too. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I just let me just do this thing real quick. Okay. Oh, let me do this thing real quick. Okay. And then three hours have passed and I've read no no sentences whatsoever in this book. And I, I feel guilty after. Um, that's why I, I like comics. Comics mm-hmm. I can read in smaller chunks. So when I want to get jump started with reading, I pick up a comic and get into that. And then when I finish that, I go back to like novels or back to nonfiction. It helps to get me like hyped about reading. Yeah, I've unfortunately got a massive stack of that as a backlog too. <laughs> There's mean, no winning here. There's no winning. There, sadly, there sadly is not. And, and I think it wasn't the case before the pandemic. The pandemic sort of created this backlog. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially for my field, it's like we've sort of never got that break or it's downtime that everyone else no. got with no, pandemic. So it's just like. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm just I'm trying trying to yeah. chip at that those stacks when I can. <laughs> yeah, it definitely takes a lot of time. That's me in podcasts. Mm-hmm. Like I I I want to I want to be super into podcasts. I want to listen to them all the time. I want to listen to audiobooks all the time. But because so much of what I do requires me to write and like think in in like words and think about language and things like mm-hmm. that, there's so much that I do that I can't listen to anybody talking. Mm-hmm. I do it, or I start typing out whatever I'm hearing instead of what right. I'm actually thinking. So I'm so criminally behind on all of the things that I love listening to. And I have a bunch of friends that make really cool stuff. So I try to listen to that as well. Um, so then it's like this, there's, it used to be a delicate balance. Now I feel like it's just a landslide, an avalanche of things that I need to listen mm-hmm. to. Um, but I am slowly getting through it very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, getting through it and not resisting the urge to add too many other things in too quickly. Yeah, that's a problem. That is a problem for me. If something looks cool, I love window shopping for new media. <laughs> <laughs> don't we all? Don't we all? Hence why the stack keeps growing. <laughs> I feel like the intentions matter, though. Mm-hmm. The intention matters, like Marie Kondo and her whole Sparks Joy. Like mm-hmm. all of those unread books spark joy for me. When I look at them, I'm like, <sighs> like I feel really satisfied to know that they're there. I'm comforted by their presence. I can't read you right now, but if I had time, I could. And you would mm-hmm. let me, and the world would be fine. Ah, yep, there you are, book. Like, I'm very comforted by looking at books sometimes in my presence. They're a very calming thing for me. They represent a great deal of comfort 
Um, Because I love those days when, like, you surprise yourself. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, I need a book today. And then you just sit down and read all day. I don't know if that ever happens Mm -hmm. to you. But sometimes that's Mm -hmm. me. I just, I get into, like, a really cozy spot somewhere in my house. And I'm like, I'm going to read today. And then I'm, like, three quarters of the way through The Alchemist and it's time for dinner. Yeah, sadly, uh, I'm principal, the one who's usually got to do a bunch of this stuff. So it's not exactly like oh. getting that time to, yeah, no. yeah. I'm, not, I'm still the one who's got to go do the laundry. I'm still the one who's got to go cook the dinner. Yeah. Uh, so, so I got the one who's got to take my cat to the vet. So mm-hmm. those moments of, yeah, as much as I would love that. No, no, no. But I think you're also hitting between what we talked about with the Legos and what we're talking about this is a question of how has dealing with the TTRPs, doing this type of work, even the horror. How has that helped your mental health? You know, it's funny. It's in some ways kind of a mixed bag. Um, Reaching back to what we were discussing about the makeup of this TTRPG community, it isn't the most diverse in the world, right? Mm -hmm. The people I play with, I've been able to cultivate a very diverse space around me and diverse Mm -hmm. spaces to be in. Um, as well as being, you know, members of diverse groups that kind of mm-hmm. seek to increase the population of of marginalized individuals that are in this community. Um, but it's still very much a very white and very male space mm-hmm. and very straight space. So um, I think for me, there there are times when my mental health is negatively impacted because I'm going and doing something very vulnerable where I am opening up my heart and opening up my mind to a group of people and trusting that they are going to respect me and trusting that, you know, we're all going to, you know, hold each other accountable and hold each other Mm -hmm. in the moments that are difficult, right? When we're coming up with conflicts, when we're dealing with loss or grief in the game, uh, when something horrific happens, right? Like you don't want to experience that with someone who you don't think is going to support you if you are distressed. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's an incredible amount of trust uh, that you kind of have to have to play these games with people. Um, And not everyone understands that or sees that or embraces that. And occasionally you find yourself in the presence of individuals uh, completely without your armor that are going to not necessarily do the nicest things or be the nicest person or say the Mm -hmm. nicest things to you or whatever um, because of the differences inherently within you. And that's whether they get whether they know they're saying something that's unpleasant or they don't know they're saying something unpleasant, right? They're just kind of within this system of oppression. Um, So I think for me that those parts have been really damaging, but what really helps me recover is the outpouring of support from other people who do get it. Um, Mm -hmm. People who do try to educate themselves, whether it's about, you know, ableism, right? Racism, uh, misogyny, transphobia, right? Um, Uh, homophobia right literally any you know social ill um trying to come from a perspective of understanding and acceptance rather than just tolerance or the opposite complete intolerance right Mm -hmm. um and i think it can be really interesting when you get at a table with people of so many different kinds of backgrounds which is why i was really reveling in our queer panel right our queer horror panel Mm -hmm. um and in those moments where that unification is found and that common ground is found and that support and understanding kind of pop up um those are really the moments that recharge me and re-energize me um and that's that it's a huge boon on my mental health like feeling after after doom scrolling and seeing everything terrible that's going on in our country and in our world and and emergencies and people that are going without and all these very heavy things that are very important um it's really nice to be able to go and save the day in a game with people that you Mm -hmm. know would save the day you know, in a way that is most befitting the global population that needs us, right? Rather than mm-hmm. the needs of a few or um, you have so much more control over uh, the story that you're telling and the circumstances within it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when there are good people there, you can do so without really having to concern yourself with feeling um, naked, right? <laughs> with feeling right. like you've overshared in some way or something like that. So it can be very healing. It can be incredibly healing. Uh, to bring um, both positive and negative aspects of yourself or your life or something you're dealing with um, in your TTRPG character. Um, Especially with horror too, like within horror exists uh, resiliency, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. the 
to me, that's like the spirit of horror is, is the resilience of the final girl or the resilience of the hero or the resilience of that last person that breathes their last breath before, you know, the entire ship blows up so nobody wins, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever amazing story that you're telling, um, I think that within horror exists that resilience and that mm -hmm. no matter how you slice it is so hopeful, right? It's full of hope, um, which I think is really inspiring and fun to play with. Very nice. And so on that note, I'll ask this as our sort of closing question. What do you think is a myth and reality around mental health? And given also what you just reflected on. I think a myth around mental health is that there's a certain type of person mm -hmm. that's affected by mental health and that other people might be less affected like, for example, mm. um, there's kind of a like a meme or like a like a saying or whatever that I see on the Internet. Uh, check on your strong friends. They need it. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's used in a very sarcastic way. But um, as someone um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm polyamorous uh, and that requires a lot of emotional um, maturity and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of openness and honesty to work. Um, which is just another kind of thing that weighs on you when you need to uh, make sure you're showing up in your life. And um, I think being strong sometimes is seen as being bulletproof, mm -hmm. which like that is not the case, right? Especially oh, if you yes. are a marginalized person, a multiple marginalized person, right? Like my intersectionality is is something that I have to, you know, deal with 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? I'm mm -hmm. never just black. I'm never just a femme. I'm never just gender fluid trans. I'm never just, you know, um, I don't know, queer, right? I'm never just mm -hmm. polyamorous. I'm all of those things at once, right? I'm never just plus size. Um, mm -hmm. So dealing with those things and then adding on top of that, you know, neurodivergence or chronic illnesses or disabilities, right? Um, right that shapes a whole person. So just because that person seems like they're strong, they kind of have to be right. <laughs> with all exactly. of Those things that they deal with each day and then have to deal with regular life, going to mm -hmm. work, finding a job, paying their bills, managing their children and their family and their households. Right. Um, so I think that uh, the biggest myth to me is that like, granted, yes, there are people who might, who might be more affected like hereditarily by by an illness mm -hmm. or you know maybe women have a higher rate than men or something like that sure like the science proves that there are people who have differences mm -hmm. in, in how they're affected and to what degree but i think that there's a real problem with assuming that especially in conflict when someone appears to be put together and strong that they're meant to just be the bigger person and that their feelings kind of don't matter right that mm -hmm. they'll get over it but this other person is really hurt, even though they were the aggressor. This mm. other person is really wounded, even though they have the privilege, right? I think that that's very difficult um, to get around. And it, and it harms a lot of people that should feel strong and that should be able to go on, but can't because they don't have the necessary support because mm -hmm. people think that they're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's my, I think that's the myth for me. Check on your strong oh. friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I don't know. I've said this. Yeah, I know I've said this with other clients, and and usually also I've had to say it to a lot of men. Mm -hmm. When did tough become synonymous with invulnerable? That right there. Yes. I and mean, we had we had the classic image of, and oftentimes there'll be the thought about the cowboy. Yeah, the cowboy was out there wearing leather, taking, falling off the horse, going all of, through all of those things. But sooner or later, that saddle, those chaps, that vest had to be replaced mm -hmm. yeah the material they were wearing could take a lot of punishment but eventually it had to be replaced mm -hmm. so thinking about that standpoint of tough equals invulnerability which it does not no. this aspect of resiliency is not does not well it, it's something it's like it's like a blade of armor it's mm -hmm. going to wear away yes yes and i think that there are a lot of people who don't recognize that like through upkeep and care that can last longer, right? Or you can mm -hmm. help someone replace their armor to make sure that they're always in a position to continue to help others because your strong friends are always there for you, right? Your strong friends mm -hmm. are always like ready to, you know, tear down the door or, you know, make a connection or communication happen that, you know, maybe went by the wayside and is causing you stress and drama. Like mm -hmm. whatever person that you lean on, like 
therapists have therapists, right? Like you, you need another form of support. And if you're the strong friend and no one is checking on you, it's okay to be your own buddy and give yourself a break. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's something that I think I've had to very much learn over years of time, um, mm-hmm. especially after watching my mom be the exact same person, who right. was the strong friend. And she's like, toughen up. Everything will be fine. And one day I was like, you don't have to be tough all the time. And she was like, no, I know. And you don't have to be tough all the time. And we kind of just had this like, we don't have to be tough conversation that was really good. Um, because it can be really hard to, to, to abandon that, right? To let that go. Mm-hmm. Like, if that's your personality and that's who you've assigned yourself to be, right? And others have bought into that or others have assigned you that and you've bought into it. It's difficult to kind of be like, no, but for real, I need, I need a timeout. <laughs> right. Well, I think there's also the mis- the mis- I mean, the mistake there, and I look at this also from the therapist standpoint, is personality identity. Mm-hmm. And there is very easy for people to use them as interchangeable when there's identity, and identity is part of a role. We play multiple roles as we move through the world. Not all of those roles have to be the strong, silent friend or mm-hmm. so-and-so. In everything, there are places where we do need to be the one in need. We need to be the gentle one. We're needing the ones who need to be also held. Absolutely. And I think in in acting um, and improv, um, a lot of it is fun and a lot of it is silly, but a lot of it is very emotional and very heavy Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. very, um, you know, touching in some Mm -hmm. cases. Um, If you are someone who really enjoys uh, stories of grief and uh resilience and power i would highly suggest transplaner they're an all trans uh Mm -hmm. and bipoc uh table of individuals that do ttrpgs fantastic show um and they tell very intense ttrpgs there's tons of moments of joy right of Mm -hmm. of bipoc joy and it's absolutely wonderful to watch and trans joy right and queer joy like it's a beautiful beautiful show but it also gets very real and it gives the mm-hmm. players a place to explore both the highs and lows of who their characters are. So when you're performing like that, right, and you're giving your all like that and you're pouring your heart out to this table, you're going to need to recharge. If your friend has a bad day and you're there for them and you support them and you grieve with them and you help pick them up off the ground, right, a part of your energy is gone. And if too many of those things happen at once, right, you have a show, you get into a fight with your partner that you end up resolving, which is mm-hmm. double the work, right? the fight is work and then the resolution is work and someone else had a bad day and you were there for them. Like you're going to be exhausted by the end of the day. Some Mm -hmm. people don't think to fill their cup back up. They're just Mm -hmm. like, "Ah, I'll sleep it off and I'll be fine. But like someone else needs to be there for you so that you can be just as strong tomorrow. Right. Even if it's just giving you a warm drink or telling you that you did a good job tonight or checking in and asking you how you're doing. Right. Whatever little thing that you might need, Try to make sure that the people around you that you surround yourself with are willing to give that to you. Because like I if I didn't have the support that I have in my life, I don't know that I'd be able to do this without completely just falling and tripping over every obstacle that's in my path. You know, um, voice acting is like is also highly competitive uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and highly stressful. Um, I kind of went from a frying pan to some fire uh, that has less rules, which is terrifying. Um, because you're making your own time Um, and it can be really really challenging but I think through the individuals that I have in my life and around me in my circles and my spaces um, Mm -hmm. I'm able to kind of keep that momentum and continue doing what I love and being there for the people that I care about without really breaking myself or causing any kind of extreme mental distress Um, it's not a perfect system therapy helps Mm -hmm. too but it's what I got right now, and I feel mm. like it's it's bolstering me in a great way. So there's those ways where you're f- filling your cup back up by listening to a very well acted, well played, and well voiced TTRP. Sometimes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so with that, where can people find more about you and list more of your work? Sure. Yeah. You can find me over at Twitter, uh, a little bit on Blue Sky at the, the Candace Marie, C A N D A C E M A R I E. Everywhere else, you can, you can pretty much find me at Candace the Magnificent. Um, I do ukulele uh, concerts sometimes on my Twitch channel and I stream video games there. Um, you can also hear me in uh, the podcast's frequencies. 
Bloomin' Blight and uh, 12 Sledded Stories, all of their stuff pretty much now that comes out has me in it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, check, take a look at my socials and, and give me a follow if you want to hear more about me. Excellent. Thank I you so much thank for you. having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here for during this Pride Month. And please keep up the work and check out all of these things, including our Queer Hour panel, which is going to be listed here in the podcast as uh, notes as well. And uh, stay tuned for the rest of uh, uh, this month. And we got a few more podcasts coming in the future. So take care, folks, and be well. Thank you for tuning in for Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. Be sure to join your host, Perry Clark, for another episode on the podcast coming soon on the Voice America Empowerment Channel.